Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. A clean heart create for me, O God, renew within me a steadfast spirit. Do everything without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. There is no doubt that purity, that being free from the stain of sin, is a biblical command. How could it not be? If sin is something that keeps us from God, then it makes sense that we should do all that we can to avoid it. Being pure is a good thing. It's just not the only thing or even the most important thing. You see, when we talk about purity, what we're basically talking about is a negation. Being pure isn't anything in itself, but is rather the absence of sin, the absence of stain. And while again, that's great, what I would do to be pure, it's not exactly the greatest goal to set our sights on. To define ourselves by what we don't have or what we don't do lends itself to a rather passive, unengaged existence in which our highest concern is simply the avoidance of temptation. If all we're focused on is not getting dirty, then we might be tempted to never go outside, to never eat spaghetti, to never do anything that could possibly ruin our nice white clothes leading us to a rather fundamental question of life. Is life really worth living if we never eat spaghetti? A question I'd like to point out is absolutely true on a literal level because, as we all know, spaghetti is God's gift to humanity and I would eat it eight days out of seven. But for the purposes of this video, I ask it metaphorically. Is life really worth living if we're too focused on avoiding the possibility of evil that we never actually seek the good? Let me offer you a scenario. Let's say that there's a person in your life that is in dire need of help. Maybe they're homeless, sick, lonely, going down a wrong path, whatever it might be. As it turns out, this person is also someone whom you find to be the most attractive person that God has ever created. When you get near this person, heck, even when you look at them, there are things that happen inside of you that you would prefer not to talk about in polite company which, if you were single or this person was your spouse, wouldn't be the worst thing. But you're married to someone else, and so are they, and so the feelings inside of you are 100% a temptation, a near occasion of sin. If all you care about is purity, then the answer is simple. Avoid this person and their needs. There is too much of a risk that you will be tempted, that you will be filled with impure thoughts, that you might even do something bad, and so, to remain pure, you must cut them out of your life and move on, leaving you pure and the other continuing to struggle with whatever they're going through with no help. More than that, your purity has gone untested and your capacity for virtue has been left unchanged. Neither of you has benefited in any way. You're just not worse off than before. Such is the logical end to a life focused only on purity as the highest goal. There may not be anything bad, but there really isn't anything good either. It's for this reason that for me, purity should never be the goal of anyone's life, but rather the effect of a life of holiness. You see, unlike purity, holiness is an active word. It isn't defined by what we don't do or by what we avoid, but rather what we do to become more like God. When we set out to be holy, we open ourselves up in prayer to be challenged. We stretch ourselves to more authentically lay down our lives for another. We let go of our fears and begin to trust more completely in the God of all. When we set our sights on holiness, not purity, we find ourselves naturally called outward to a life of service and humility, undeterred by dangers or temptations. Pope Francis said it perfectly in Evangelii Gaudium, I prefer a church which is bruised, hurting, and dirty because it has been out on the streets rather than a church which is unhealthy from being confined and from clinging to its own security. Those who lock themselves in churches out of fear, who wall themselves up to avoid temptation, who choose to not engage with the messiness of life because, well, it's messy, they may remain pure, but they know nothing of holiness. Holiness goes out. It makes us vulnerable. It engages with the world so that we can be conduits of God's grace to transform and heal the world. And you know what? It also purifies. When you think of the purest souls that the world has ever seen, don't you think of Mother Teresa? Don't you think of Mary, the mother of God? 
two people who let their hearts be broken by the poor, who called for justice, who were active in prayer, holding on to all the many ills of the world in their hearts. They were pure of heart precisely because they sought holy lives. Purity was the effect of their lives, not the goal. And so it should be with us. Now, is there a greater risk to this? Of course. When you get yourself involved with the mess of the world, there's a chance you're going to get messy. You may occasionally find yourself tempted. You may suffer a bit more. You may even struggle with sin. But at least it will be a struggle. At least it will be a life lived rather than a life avoided. God tells us to be pure, yes, but not because we ran from difficulty and hid, not as an end in itself. What he wants are men and women with such virtue that they can engage with the world and yet remain faithful, who can do the work of God even when it's difficult. That is the goal. That is what purity really means to God. It isn't about hiding from evil. It's about confronting it head on and showing the world that good will always triumph. Don't define your life by what you don't do, by what you avoid. Define your life by your pursuit of holiness, imitating Christ in all that you do. Do that, and I have no doubt in my mind that you will be left with a pure and clean heart, ready to see God.